In this unit, we're going to discuss the Bronsted acid-base chemistry of organic compounds, otherwise known as proton transfer reactions. A Bronsted acid-base reaction involves the transfer of a proton, H+, from an acid to a base. And proton transfer reactions and elementary steps are ubiquitous in organic reaction mechanisms. And so getting a firm understanding of the theory here, particularly um, hearkening back to ideas about chemical equilibrium, for instance, from introductory chemistry, what you already know about equilibrium constants, acidity constants, the conjugate seesaw, conjugate acids and bases, and all that fun stuff from the acid-base unit of your introductory chemistry courses is going to be really important here. We're also going to look at the structural factors that affect acidity and basicity in organic compounds, and this is really the most important and most enduring lesson of this unit. Being able to look at a molecule, particularly a molecule containing charge, a cation or anion, and draw some inferences and make some comparisons of the stability of that molecule to some reference or, or relative molecule. For example, comparing the stabilities of reactants and products. The broad ideas and concepts we develop in this unit are going to be applicable, applicable throughout your study of polar organic reactions involving ionic intermediates. We're always comparing and contrasting reactive intermediates and reactants and products to think about the thermodynamics of organic reactions. And we're gonna see the structural basis of those comparisons here. It's very exciting. Trust me when I say you'll use the concepts we develop here over and over and over again throughout your study of organic chemistry. So first and foremost, we're gonna look at Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reactions in an organic context recognizing, for example, conjugate acids and bases in that context. We're going to revisit curved arrows, looking at how they're applied in reaction mechanisms now and focusing on the proton transfer elementary step and what curved arrows look like when H plus is transferred from an acid to a base. We're going to return to the idea of Ka, the equilibrium constant for acid dissociation, and pKa, which is more commonly used in an organic context because it's a more human-friendly number, and uh, organic chemists abhor numbers and despise exponents, which is why we use pKa. Um, and we're going to learn how to apply acidity constants to make predictions about acid-base reactions in a quantitative sense. We're also going to learn how to make qualitative predictions of the relative acidity and basicity of organic compounds. And this is way more important than having a grasp of the quantitative um, ideas in Learning Objective 3. Because again, these ideas are going to endure th to polar reactions that have no direct proton transfer involved, where just one ion becomes some other ion. These structural stability factors that we're going to see when we dig into this learning objective, you're going to apply throughout your study of polar organic reaction mechanisms. We can apply these principles of acid-base equilibrium in, in learning objectives three and four in a number of ways, and one way we can, we can apply them is to choose an appropriate acid or base to accomplish a proton transfer that we need or want to do. For example, if we want to remove a proton to create an anion that is nucleophilic, we need to choose a base that's strong enough to do that, and we can use pKa values to do that and the structural stability factors, and that's the idea here. We'll talk, touch on leveling effects, which is an important limitation on the types of acids and bases you can use in practical organic reactions occurring in solution. The solvent limits the strength of acids and bases you can use. Basically, the solvent's uh, conjugate acid and conjugate base provide a window for acids and bases that uh, you can use in that solvent. We'll see how that works, and this is really just an application on some level of learning objective three. and, and principles of acid-base equilibrium apply, applied to the solvent in organic reactions. Finally, we'll return to Lewis acid-base theory at the end of this unit, recognizing Lewis acids and bases in the context of these ionic organic reactions and introducing the terms nucleophile and electrophile, which are hugely important for understanding how polar organic reaction mechanisms work. Let's start by reviewing Bronsted-Lowry acid-base theory. A Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reaction involves the transfer of a proton from a Bronsted acid to a Bronsted base. And in the transfer of a proton, the acid loses the proton and is converted, for example, from HA to A-, and the base is converted from, say, B- to HB when it picks up the proton. And so the species that are related by the loss or gain of one proton are known as a conjugate pair. 
and a conjugate pair HA and A minus. The species with the extra proton is called the conjugate acid, and the species lacking that proton is called the conjugate base. And the reason the conjugate concept is useful is because conjugate pairs appear on opposite sides of Bronsted-Lowry acid base equilibria. For example, here we have an acid base reaction between tert-butoxide and water, H2O. Water acts as an acid and gives up a proton. We'll look at curved arrows showing the electron flow to accomplish this here shortly. And so water becomes hydroxide, the conjugate base of H2O is OH minus. The base, tert-butoxide, picks up the proton and becomes neutral tert-butanol. This is the conjugate acid of the base, tert-butoxide. And you can see both of these pairs of species linked by the red and blue lines are related by the gain or loss of one proton. There's another example here. Here we have protonated tetrahydrofuran. This is an important organic solvent with water. Water is now acting as a base. Water is amphiprotic. It can act as an acid or a base. And here it is gaining a proton to form the conjugate acid. This is known as hydronium, a species you should be familiar with from your introductory organic courses. And the conjugate base of protonated THF, or tetrahydrofuran, is tetrahydrofuran itself. Notice neutral charge, we've lost that proton, and, so, and we have an additional lone pair where that bond H was in the conjugate acid. All right, so this is the basics of Bronsted-Lowry acid base theory. A proton transfer is the first and arguably the simplest elementary step that we'll come across in reaction mechanisms. And we previously noted that chemical reactions are accomplished by movement or the flow of electrons within or between molecules, and we use curved arrows to represent those electron flows. Now, curved arrows, if, if you know nothing about them, can vi look very complex very quickly, but a point I'll make now, and something we'll return to later, is that the number of possible moves you can make with curved arrows, it's limited to about 10 possibilities. Just like the resonance case where we looked at structural patterns that kind of activated your mind for particular resonance electron flows, particular structures within organic compounds that are reacting with each other will start to activate your brain for particular types of electron flows. And the number of those patterns and the number of possible moves is definitely limited here. All right, on this slide, we want to focus on proton transfer, one of the simplest and probably still relatively familiar to you from introductory chemistry elementary steps. So the idea of proton transfer is that H plus is transferred from the acid to the base. Now, H plus has no electrons, and this is important to keep in mind. The transfer of H plus is accomplished via the donation of a pair of electrons from the base and cleavage of the HA bond towards A. This results in the net transfer of H plus and the formation of A minus, the conjugate base of HA. So notice the fate of each electron pair here. The lone pair that starts on B becomes involved in a BH bond in the product, in the conjugate acid of B minus. The bonding pair of electrons between H and A in the acid becomes involved in a lone pair on the conjugate base A minus. And the, this is what these electron flow arrows are showing us here. The example below is just a concrete example of this electron flow with hydroxide as the base and acetic acid, a carboxylic acid, as the acid here. Uh, notice this lone pair on hydroxide is used to make a bond to H so that lone pair of electrons becomes involved in an OH bond in the conjugate acid, H2O, and the OH bond in the starting acid breaks toward oxygen, leaving a lone pair on that oxygen and decreasing its formal charge by one unit, producing the conjugate base. So note here also the changes in formal charge. The base, because it donates a pair of electrons, converts a lone pair into a bond, increases in formal charge by one unit, and the acid, in converting a bond into a lone pair on A, decreases in formal charge by one unit. And here we're showing an anionic base and a neutral acid, but a neutral base and a neutral acid, a neutral base and a cationic acid are also possible here. There are all kinds of, of possible formal charge permutations, but these changes in formal charge consistently occur in proton transfer reactions because H plus is transferred, and that's the definition, essentially, of proton transfer. 
In this quick example problem, we're going to use curved arrows to depict the mechanism of this proton transfer elementary step, and then we're going to label the acid and base on the reactant side, and the conjugate acid and conjugate base on the product side. So to get started with the curved arrows, one thing we can do is compare the structures of the reactants and products and look for bonds made and broken, the, the appearance of new lone pairs, and changes in formal charge. So here, for example, we can notice this OH bond becomes a lone pair on the oxygen of hydroxide, and the formal charge of water decreases by one unit to form hydroxide. On the other side of the coin, we've got a lone pair becoming a new bond to hydrogen and going from methoxide to methanol, and the formal charge of methoxide is increasing by one unit. So this suggests a proton transfer from water to methoxide. We're going to move a lone pair on methoxide into a new bond to hydrogen and break the OH electrons, uh, OH bond, toward oxygen. All right, so the curved arrows look something like this, and this, the, this electron flow gives us insight into what are the acid and, and what are the base, right? Water is the acid here, it's giving up the proton, and methoxide is the base, and in transferring its proton, water forms its conjugate base, hydroxide, and in picking up the proton, methoxide forms its conjugate acid, methanol. So hydroxide is the conjugate base, and methanol the conjugate acid here. Proton transfer reactions are generally very fast. They reach equilibrium very, very quickly, particularly relative, relative to the other elementary steps we'll see. Proton transfers are, as a rule, very, very fast. And so they're, how they proceed and whether they proceed all depends on the theory of chemical equilibrium and the magnitude of the equilibrium constant for the proton transfer that we're considering. So here we're drawing on fundamental ideas about chemical equilibrium from your introductory chemistry course. The equilibrium constant for a proton transfer reaction in a particular solvent is known as an acidity constant when the species of interest is acting as an acid. And this reflects the tendency of a particular proton within an organic molecule to act as a Bronsted acid in a given solvent. So we can assign a, a Ka or pKa value to every proton within an organic molecule. Now generally, we're going to focus on the most acidic proton. For example, in this compound succinamide, this proton highlighted in blue is far and away the most acidic, for reasons we'll touch on when we talk about the structural approach to acidity comparisons and thinking about acidity uh, very shortly. The solvent we typically think about here is either water or dimethyl sulfoxide for organic acids and bases that are not soluble in water. And just thinking about water here, we're thinking about a reaction of succinamide, or more generally an acid, HA, with water as a base. So water picks up a proton or accepts a proton from the acid HA, and the products are the conjugate base, A-, minus. this is the conjugate base of succinamide, and this is a good opportunity to pause and verify that A- minus does have this structure, and in gaining a proton, water is converted to hydronium. We can write an equilibrium constant for this reaction using fundamental ideas about chemical equilibrium. Products over reactants, right? Product concentrations divided by reactant concentrations. And this equilibrium constant in particular is known as Ka, the acidity constant. And it's the concentration of A-, minus, the conjugate base, times the concentration of hydronium at equilibrium, divided by the concentration of unionized or, or unreacted HA, reactant HA at equilibrium, if you like. Now these tend to span a huge range from something like 10 to the 10th power for very strong acids to 10 to the negative 50 for neg negligibly weak acids, things like methane, CH4, and those exponents are a bit annoying to deal with, so what we do is take the negative base 10 logarithm of the Ka value to get what's called the pKa. This is a more human-friendly number, and it's actually proportional to energies related to this process, as we may touch on later. So, what do Ka and pKa tell us? Well, the greater Ka is, the greater the extent of deprotonation of an acid at chemical equilibrium. So these species with very high K values are very strong acids, very low or very small K values are negligibly weak acids. And notice with pKa, because there's a negative sign here, stronger acids have more negative pKa values. So a Ka value of 10 to the 10th would be associated with a pKa value of negative 10. Keep that in mind when you're looking at pKa values, which are very commonly tabulated.
And speaking of tabulated pKa values, these tables from the Klein textbook touch on some useful benchmarks for pKa values. None of these are worth memorizing, but they give you some good benchmarks to kind of orient yourself on the relative acidity of common functional groups and common species in organic chemistry. A few things I want to point out here. This pKa is not correct in the Klein textbook. It should be zero. The pKa of hydronium in water is zero by definition, more or less. And, and likewise, the pKa of water is 14, not 15.7 if we're talking about pKa in water. But aside from that, I won't say too much about these benchmarks just yet, but these are worth returning to after we've talked about the structural approach to acidity. Because you'll start to be able to rationalize why, for example, acetylene, this hydrogen linked to an sp hybridized carbon, is way, way more acidic than ethylene and ethane, where the H is linked to an sp2 or sp3 hybridized carbon, respectively. The structural factors that give rise to these trends in acidity and pKa values are something we're going to dig into in detail in the very near future. Finally, I want to touch briefly on the basicity constant, Kb or pKb. This is an equilibrium constant for a base of interest, if we call it, we can call it B in general, with some solvent, typically water again or DMSO, to produce the conjugate acid of the species of interest and the conjugate base of the solvent, which in the case of water is OH minus. We can write an, a reaction quotient associated with Kb using fundamental ideas about chemical equilibrium, and we can take the negative base 10 logarithm of that Kb value to get pKb, a more human-friendly number. And just like pKa, the more negative this is, the stronger the base. But Kb and pKb are rarely reported. You'll rarely see them written or, or you know, used in problems or out there on the internet. They're rarely measured. And this is because of the conjugate seesaw, a fundamental idea you should be familiar with from introductory chemistry, the acid-base unit there. The stronger an acid, the weaker its conjugate base. And the, the weaker an acid, the stronger its conjugate base. There's this seesaw relationship and strength for conjugate pairs. We can represent that as the pKa of an acid, HA, plus the pKb of its conjugate base, A minus, is equal to a constant. And this is pK for self-ionization of the solvent. Self-ionization of water, for example, is the, the constant value there. And so no, a couple things to note here. This is for conjugates only right? Only for these species that are related by the gain or loss of a single proton. And what this means in a qualitative and practical sense is that if I know an acid is more acidic, I know its conjugate base is less basic. If I know an acid is less acidic, I know its conjugate base is more basic. If I know things about the base, well, I can make inferences about the conjugate acid kind of by moving in the opposite direction, conceptually speaking, so to speak.